So the next speaker is one of our new faculty hires, uh, Karen Pelka. Um, she started her lab just in September uh, at the Gladstone and joined us from the Broad Institute where she led a cross-disciplinary multi-institutional single cell RNA-seq and spatial profiling effort on human colorectal cancer. Um, she's a member of the American Association for Cancer Research, the German Society for Immunology and the Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer. And her work broadly aims to understand how immunological processes are regulated in human tissues in order to leverage the immune system in the fight against diseases such as cancer. Um, so I'll hand it over to you, Karen. Thank you so much, Stacey. So I hope you can all see my screen and myself and hear me. Yep, looks good. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm super thrilled to be here and it's really awesome to see this institute coming together in such a wonderful way. As Alex and Stacy mentioned, I'm really one of the newest ones and just moved over two months ago from the Broad Institute um, to now start my lab here at the Gladstone. So I'm really, really excited. Um, just before the break, actually, you heard from Matt about the different levels of immune responses on the organism level, on the tissue level, on the cellular level. The level where my lab is starting is um, on the tissue level. And my goal really is to understand what I call immune hubs in human tumors to unleash the full potential of immunotherapy. So today I would like to tell you a little bit more about these immune hubs. We heard a lot about that immune cells do need to um, coordinate with each other. They do not work in isolation. They need to coordinate with each other and also with tissue resident non-immune cells in order to accomplish their tasks. And for that, spatial organization on, and also um, uh, temporal coordination is really key. Again, you heard a beautiful story about the temporal coordination of the priming of T-cell responses. Um, and this is actually also a great example where the spatial organization is really important if you look at these spatially highly organized lymphoid structures. Another example where this temporal coordination is really evident is when you look at neutrophils that swarm towards wounded tissue that really coordinate with each other in, in a highly temporally coordinated manner. But how these immune responses are regulated in human tumors that are very disorganized is still not well understood. And so we thought now that we're able to actually take apart these tumors into the individual elements, all these cell types and cell states and gene programs by doing single cell RNA sequencing, shouldn't we be able to use these, this information and put together the cell types and states and predict what the different types and states of multicellular interaction networks are? And this is what I call immune hubs. And we figured because immune cells are healthy cells and they follow specific rules, maybe there's just a limited number of these different types of multicellular interaction networks. So it would be great to find them back in the tumor tissue. And um, maybe it's possible to actually explain these very heterogeneous and, and disorganized tumors as a combination of just a small number of shared functional units. And this, this, is, this is what the idea was of the study that um, I led together with Matan and John at the Broad Institute, which is kind of the proof of principle of, of what we're trying to do here. So as you can see from the author list, similar to immune cells, I really enjoy working in teams and leverage different expertise. Um, so I teamed up with Matan, who is a computational biologist, and John, who is a pathologist. And we did this work um, really in a cross-institutional effort between the Broad Institute, MGH, the DFCI, and the Evergreen Center under amazing guidance from Aviv and Nir. So the question that we started out with in this project was how are immune responses regulated in, in human corrector cancer? Corrector cancer is clinically extremely relevant. It's the second leading cause of cancer-related death in the United States, but it's also immunologically super interesting. And this is because it exists in two very different types there's a small percentage of patients, 15% of patients, that present with tumors that have a defect in the mismatch repair system. So whenever the DNA gets replicated, these um, tumors accumulate lots of mutations. So the tumor mutational burden of these tumors is very high, which probably makes it more easy for the immune system to detect these tumors. And so these tumors have a high response rate to immunotherapy. The vast majority of patients um, unfortunately present with tumors that do not have this defect in the mismatch repair system. So that's 85% of the patients. Those tumors have a much lower tumor mutation burden and they're essentially unresponsive. 
So we wanted to understand in the, these two immunologically very distinct settings, how are the immune responses regulated? And for this, we assembled a cohort of 62 patients, all of them presented with primary untreated corrective cancer, half of them with these very immunogenic mismetropate deficient tumors, and half with this um, um, the much less immunogenic mismetropate proficient tumors. From those patients, we collected the surgical resection specimens, and then we analyzed both the tumor tissue and the adjacent normal colon tissue. Now, the first question was, let's take these tumors apart into the individual elements and understand what the cellular composition of these two types of corrector cancer are. For that, we performed single cell RNA sequencing. This was on 400,000 single cells across 100 different specimens which are these mismetropic deficient tumors, the mismetropic proficient tumors, and the normal colon, colon tissue. And then we applied a, a traditional a clustering method to first divide our data set into larger cellular compartments, which are essentially different lineages of the immune system, as well as the stroma cells and the epithelial cells. Um, and our corrected tumors, the epithelial cells are, are the malignant cells. So this now enabled us to compare our normal tissue with these two types of tumors and understand what the compositional differences are. And here I'm just showing you the immune compartment and I don't want to go into detail with um, all the differences that we found, just really want to point out um, what the striking difference was from these mismetropia deficient tumors, these immunogenic tumors uh, compared um, to the mismetropia proficient tumors. Um, which was this, these populations of um, CXA13 positive T cells. These are both CD4 positive and CD8 positive T cells. And they really emerge now in a number of different human tumors as the T cells that are probably the ones that react against the tumor. So we were really excited um, to find these T cells and, and to understand where, where they're actually present. And so we stained um, both for CXA13 and red and CD3 in blue. And as you can see, um, we actually found them um, and, and in the tumor center in close proximity to the malignant cells, which would be consistent with um, their potential activity against uh, the tumor. And uh, this was actually initially quite surprising because as immunologists, uh, we know CXCF13 as a chemokine that's really important for the attraction of B cells and for the generation of lymphoid structures. Indeed, very often in these immunogenic tumors, we do see lymphoid structures right below the invasive margin, and there is a lot of CXA13 signal um, in these B cell zones of the lymphoid structures. But as expected from the literature, this, this is actually not produced by the T cells. Um, this is follicular dendritic cells, and the CXA13 producing T cells, there's some in the T cell zone, but really a lot we found in the, in the tumor center. So these T cells you should keep in mind because they will be important again at the end of the talk. Um, the second example that I want to show you is um, in the mild compartment, where we saw a huge expansion of both monocytes and macrophages in both types of corrector cancer, um, as you can see here. But this also shows nicely how actually this clustering-based approach is limited in a way, because if we look at the T-SNE of these mild cells, you can see how in the normal colon tissue, you get very nice distinct clusters of cells and can distinguish these monocytes from the macrophages without a problem. But once you move into the pathologic context of the tumors, um, you see this huge expansion of the transcriptional um, space um, and the, the borders of these clusters really merge together. So then clustering is, is kind of artificially dividing these cells into groups where there's no clear border anymore. So therefore, we wanted to find a, an approach that can describe this biology in a, in a better way. And we asked, well, what are the coordinate functions of programs within each of these cells? Thinking that each cell can utilize multiple programs at the same time, and they might not necessarily be active in a digital way where it's one cluster or the other, but there might, these, might be this uh, gradual uh, polarization states of, of, of the cells. And we were excited to come across this method called non-negative matrix factorization, which essentially allowed us to de novo discover transcriptional programs from this rich single cell RNA sequencing data set. And the idea here is that you look at the transcriptomes from all of your single cells and um, just group genes together that seem to be coordinated together with each other. 
And so like this, you can discover these individual gene programs. And for each gene program, you will then also learn how much of this particular gene program is used by each individual cell. So then you can describe the transcriptome of each cell as a combination of multiple programs, and you know how much of the program is used. So we applied this method to each of our cell lineages separately to discover these transcriptional programs. And um, this revealed both programs that were um, very cell type specific, such as this plasmacytic dendritic cell program, which um, is active in just a very specific population of cells, these PDCs here. But it also discovered programs that um, were shared across multiple different cell lineages. Here you can see activity in multiple parts of this TSNE, um, like this interference stimulated gene program. And this now gave us a tool to much better describe the biology that we saw in these smallet cells, um, because you can see how there are a number of, of programs, and here I'm just listing the top genes of these programs um, that were active in, in this part of the TSNE that's very specific to these tumors. And you can see how these activities are actually gradual if you look on a, um, on a per cell level, but we can also then compute how these um, activities uh, like how each, what the activity of each of these programs is per patient. Um, and here you can see that where each dot is one patient, you can see that indeed many of these programs only came up in the tumor context, but were essentially not present or significantly lower in the normal colon specimens. This lens of um, gene programs also gave us the opportunity to look um, at uh, um, look which gene programs are similar um, with each other, even if they're expressed in different cell lineages. Not surprisingly, for, for example, proliferation is used by multiple cell types and various metabolic programs such as glycolysis. And the same is true for these um, immune-related programs such as inflammatory programs or um, interference-stimulated gene programs. So now we had a good dictionary, both of cell types and these transcriptional gene programs um, that were able to describe our data set in, in a much more granular way. And importantly, this now also allowed us to go from these individual elements to these functional units by predicting which of the cells with which of the functions are actually working together. And we did that by predicting these multi cell interaction networks based on the co-variation of program activities across patient specimens. So the idea is that if two programs and two different cells are working together with each other, the activity should correlate if we look across the different tumor specimens. And this is visualized here in these big heat maps where now um, all the rows and the columns are our programs. Um, and then we just show the pairwise correlations. Whenever you see red, it's a very strong correlation. There's some programs that are anti-correlated that are shown here in blue. And then we just group together um, these pairwise correlated programs into what we call these hubs. And we actually did that separately for our immunogenic mismatch repair deficient tumors and these um, much less immunogenic mismatch repair proficient tumors. So now we did look for the correlation of these gene programs, um, and we know which programs are active um, in a correlated manner, but this could have different reasons. One reason would be that maybe the program two contains a ligand that's directly inducing program three, in which case we might find receptor ligand pairs between these programs or between these cells that we find correlated with each other. Another scenario would be that there might be a shared stimulus, um, for example, hypoxia, that's actually inducing both of these programs. Um, in this case, the gene sets of these programs might look very similar. And we actually found both of these um, situations um, in our in immune hubs. And to make this more concrete, I want to introduce two specific immune hubs now to you that we identified and that we think are really important in these tumors. Um, the first example is an example um, that we think is driving the inflammation in both types of colorectal cancer. So I'm showing you the hub here in the mismatch repair deficient tumors, but we found that in a very similar way also in our analysis of the mismatch repair proficient tumors. And this particular hub contained inflammatory signatures in the myelid cells and the malignant cells, and they um, co-occurred together with neutrophils and regulatory T cells. 
And if we look at the activity of these key programs of the hub, again, in our patient specimens, we can see that they're active in both types of corrector cancer and significantly more active than in these um, normal colon tissues. So now we knew which programs seem to co-occur together. Now we were able to ask, okay, what are the genes in these programs that might mediate the communication between the cells? And this pointed us to the CXA1 and 2 chemokine system, um, because essentially the malignant cells, the inflammatory monocytes, and also these fibroblasts all expressed ligands for CXA1 and 2 that are expressed on, on these neutrophils. So we think that these cells are working together to recruit the neutrophils to the tissue. Other genes that were really high in the program, especially um, for these inflammatory monocytes, were these cytokines, IL-1, IL-5, IL-1, beta, TNF, and IL-6. If we now take these cytokines as recombinant versions and add them in vitro on either the malignant cells or fibroblasts that we extracted from the tumors, we can actually induce the programs that we saw co-varying together in our single cell analysis of these primary human tumor tissues. So to us, this suggests that these cytokines that are produced by the myeloid cells might amplify this inflammatory reaction by inducing these programs in the malignant cells and the fibroblasts, essentially creating a positive feedback mechanism that um, drives the inflammation. Now, I mentioned we did not want to um, only um, identify these hubs, but we also wanted to know where in the tissue these responses might be happening. And if maybe these hubs could explain some of the, the heterogeneity that we see in these tumors. So we stained our tumor tissues from these patients for some of the key features of these hubs that we had identified. In this particular case, we went for these granule sites um, by staining for CD666B, which you can see in gray. Um, then for the um, IL-1 beta, which is this inflammatory cytokine, and CXCA1 in, in green um, as one of these chemokines that can attract these neutrophils. Um, and in blue, you can see the malignant cells. So what we're looking at here is actually the border of the malignant cells to the colonic lumen. And we found that all of these features, if we quantify multiple patients, were significantly enriched at this luminal margin of these tumors. Um, and this was also true for these inflammatory fibroblasts that here are stained with MMP3 um, matrix metalloproteinase um, that really is, uh, turned out to be uh, our best marker for these inflammatory fibroblasts. Also, these inflammatory fibroblasts accumulated um, right at the luminal margin. And you can see that a little bit better if we zoom out. You can really appreciate this band of inflammatory fibroblasts right here. So we think it might be the damage that's happening at this, the surface of this epithelium from this tumor um, that, and, and maybe the access to the microbiome in the lumen that's really driving this inflammatory reaction. So we were able to find this hub in a computational manner located in the tumor and by knowing where it is, gain some more information what actually might be driving this immune reaction. The second example that I want to show to you is what we think is the anti-tumor immunity hub. Um, so this, we, this hub we actually only found in the mismetropate deficient tumors, which I told you are these immunogenic tumors. This hub did not come together in the same way in these mismetropate proficient tumors. And this hub contained these CXA13 positive T cells that I told you at the very start about that we think are these tumor reactive T cells. It also contains interfungamma expressing T cells, which is um, really important for the activity of these T cells and T cell proliferation programs. And they co-occurred with interferon-stimulated gene programs in the malignant and the myeloid cells and dendritic cell programs. So lots of features that um, suggest that this might be really um, anti-tumor responses. And in this case, all of the key features are um, much more active in the mismetropate deficient versus the mismetropate proficient tumors. Again, suggesting that this hub is specific to these immunogenic tumors. Now, knowing which programs are coming together, we were able, again, to look at the ligands and receptors that might mediate the communication. And in this case, we think it's really the interferon gamma from these activated and chronically stimulated T cells that's driving the interferon-stimulated gene signatures in the myeloid and the malignant cells. And interestingly, um, important in these interferon-stimulated gene programs are really these 6 3 chemokines 
and these CXA3 chemokines might attract more T cells into the tissue because um, these T cells actually upregulate CXA3, the receptor for these ligands. So again, there might be a positive feedback mechanism um, whereby the, the malignant and the malignant cells might attract more, more T cells into the tissue. At the same time, in this hub, there's a lot of inhibitory molecules upregulated both on the T cells and on the malignant and the malignant cells. So while we do think the starts is a, the attempt of the immune system to attack the tumor, there are a lot of suppressive features that actually might turn these hubs in, into suppressive um, hubs in the tissue. Um, now, again, we wanted to know where in the tissue is this, is this happening. So we stain for our key features, namely the CXA3 chemokine, which you can see in yellow, the T cells in gray, um, and then CXA3 teen as a marker of these chronically activa activated T cells and interferon gamma as, a, um, a, as an activation marker of these T cells. And you can see how, how these hubs form these little focal structures essentially at the border of the malignant epithelium with, with the stroma here, and how these hubs were really enriched for, for T cells um, in general, and also these 6 a 13 and the interferon gamma positive T cells. So this was quite remarkable to us to find these immune responses being so spatially organized in, in the tissue. Um, and we actually applied these stainings to whole tissue specimens. So these are the pathology specimens from the patients that we had profiled, um, we phenotyped the cells um, and then used neighborhood features of the cells to uh, um, essentially define what is a hub and what is not a hub so that we could um, automatically assign these hubs in, in the tissues. And this enabled us to then quantify that indeed both the 6A13 positive T cells and the T cells in general were enriched in these hubs. And it also allowed us to now compare our different patient specimens with each other. So here you can see three different mismatch repair deficient tumors. All of those show these hubs, but you can see how um, the distribution, the spatial distribution and how many hubs you have is quite different from patient to patient. Here, for example, you see it only at the invasive margin and there's a, a markable difference between this part of the tumor and down here where essentially there's, there's nothing happening. And uh, we only found the hubs in the mismatch repair deficient tumors consistent with uh, what we've seen in the, in the single cell RNA sequencing data. So to summarize, um, I've shown you how we discovered these immune hubs in human colorectal cancer via a novel approach, um, which really was built on taking apart these tumors into the individual elements. And then the trick was to not only look at these different cluster of cells, but to really de novo derive these transcriptional programs that we think are the functions of the cells, which allowed us to then understand not only which cell types are part of these immune hubs or these teams of cells that are working together in a cooperative way, but to understand what the function is of the individual cells that, that are part of these hubs. So this helps us to organize a, a, a large number of cell types and states um, into smaller units where for each unit we know um, what the type of hubs are, what the transcriptional programs are in which cell types and what the genes are in each of these programs. And it also helped us to recognize these units across these patient specific tumor landscapes. So this is, this is my last slide, but just to tell you what, um, what now the future vision is of this lab. Now that we profiled all these patient specimens and predicted what types and states of immune hubs um, are present in these human tissues. Now we really want to understand them so that we can leverage this knowledge in order to design better biomarkers, um, find better drug targets, um, and also rationally design combination therapies. Um, and for this, we first need to um, understand which of these types of hubs are actually relevant to the therapeutic outcome of the patients. And that's something we can do by analyzing clinical trial specimens. And this is actually ongoing work. Right now we're um, analyzing specimens from two different clinical trials where we have pre and on treatment specimens from responding and non-responding patients and kind of can understand how these hubs are, are changing in this therapeutic context. So this should tell us what are the important features um, that, that we need to modulate in order to make immunotherapy work. Um, and then the, the last step is really to perturb these hubs experimentally. This is important to understand how these hubs form, what the function is, how they evolve, and what these communication pathways are between the hubs. 
So here we're planning to use both human ex vivo model systems and, and transplantable tumor models to essentially perform gain and loss of function experiments and see how they influence the wiring of these hubs and, and what the communication pathways are between them. And the hope is that this could point us to better biomarkers and, and to new drug targets. And with this, I would like to thank the CSC Immune Hub team back, um, back in Boston. Um, again, I, I led this project together with Matan um, and John. Um, Sisi was also uh, really essential in driving this project over the finish line. This was done in uh, uh, amazing collaboration with the Evergreen Center, MGH, the Brigham Women's Hospital, and under the mentorship of Aviv and Nir. And with this, I would like to thank you for listening. Um, I'm really, really excited now to engage in new collaborations in, in our new institute. And if you want to join the new team, please reach out.